It's very difficult to follow the light up bass, which was awesome with date time, but I'm gonna try. Uh, <laughs> I'm Maggie Johnson Pitt. Uh, I work for Microsoft. I, I also collaborate with TC39. Uh, if, if you're like, didn't you have the same last name as that guy? It was my husband who talked about Stack Overflow earlier today. So like, if you want to click it together now, you know. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about programming in the fourth dimension time, right? Like physicists, it's always the fourth dimension in their equations. Uh, so day, day in the life of, of Maggie, especially like when I'm somewhere like here. Um, hey Maggie, can I have a moment? I do maintain that library with a few other people. Uh, did you know about that falsehoods programmers believe about time video or that place where midnight doesn't exist, I think it's in South America somewhere, or that Leap Year 2012 bricked every Zoom for an entire day? Um, did, did you know we might colonize Mars soon? Do you know how we're gonna keep time there? Because I think that's really important right now at this instant. Um, there's some country somewhere where there's a whole day missing to a time zone change. Have we accounted that for that in all of our models? Um, there's a gap between the Julian and Gregorian calendar and we need historical accuracy. And I'm like, yes, I know all of those things. Um, <laughs> I can actually tell you about 100 other corner cases in date time. Um, what I do want to say, though, is I think as programmers, we sort of think about date and time as fun trivia, and then we go, not doing it, not learning it. Uh, too hard, ridiculous. Um, but here's the thing. Getting this stuff right, it matters a lot. Date and time is a primary application in computing. People rely on code to give them accurate date and time. Uh, and it's really critical to people getting places on time, paychecks having the right amount of money, uh, coordinating international conference calls, uh, like world peace, maybe, like what, <laughs> uh, medical device behavior. I, I was talking to Jana who spoke yesterday. Uh, she's a person with diabetes about the work that she's done in date time in insulin pump and it's like, that is serious, like, we, we've got to get that right. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing that I think is really important to keep in mind with daytime is that it's really easy to say, well, that doesn't matter. But when you say, well, it doesn't matter that I can't support time in Nepal with its plus 45 offset, plus 545 offset, you're really saying, the people in Nepal don't deserve an accurate time. Uh, ultimately, daytime programming errors uh, disproportionately affect people who live in time zones that we don't live in, who speak languages other than English. A lot of our formats default to English. Uh, I love giving these talks in Europe because people are like, we know. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, so it, it, it actually, hourly wage workers, uh, they're gonna be affected. If we don't get DST changes correctly, they're gonna lose an hour of compensation. Um, so it disproportionately affects actually more marginalized people. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. So here, those of us who write JavaScript have been using the worst solution possible. Uh, so date has a lot of problems. Uh, I'm gonna go kind of quickly here through some of those problems. Here's a simple one. Look at me trying to make December 3rd and getting January 3rd. Why the months index from zero? Why programmers? Um, this one is probably one of the worst problems that we have with the Moment.js library because it papers over the problem and kind of exacerbates it in a worse way. But dates are mutable. Now, you typically don't want a value type to mutate, if that makes sense. Um, and you get lots of uh, transient code errors like this one where you see I've created an add days function because we don't have an add days. You set the date and then you add three, which is also terrible. Um, and then I'm, I'm returning the date back. And when I invoke it like I did down there, you see me passing in December 3rd, trying to add three days, and then getting uh, both dates turned into December 5th because of that mutability aspect, which is not good. Uh, time zone gaps. I can print out my local time. I can print out UTC. If I want to understand, uh, next week I have to meet with the Bay Area team and I'm in France, what's nine o'clock Bay Area time here in Paris? We ain't got nothing for that. Um, no date only representation. This one's a little more complex, but birth dates are a common case for this. So say I wanna create Mr. Sulu's birthday. Um, I pass in 2014-9-12, which is Mr. Sulu's birthday. 
Uh, and here you see me calling to date string, and it gives me back September 11th. Um, there's two things going on here. One, we don't have a way to represent just a date. And two, we have inexplicable parsing behavior. Um, what's going on is that it's interpreting that first string, 2014.9.12, as UTC. And then if you pass it in with a time of zero, it interprets that as local time. So you see the two different result and outputs on this slide. Uh, this is in conflict with the ISO 8601 standard for date, date time. Those should both be interpreted as local time according to that standard. But this is the way in which we live. Dan, who's talking after this, can tell you a ton about it, but I don't think he's going to during his talk, but he knows the most about this. Um, <laughs> By the way, Mr. Sulu is my dog. If you all were like, I think George Takei was born long before 2014. Um, this is my dog, Mr. Sulu. Um, so uh, the biggest problem really that we have with date and time in JavaScript is that it's what you might call an incomplete domain model. So I don't know how many people here are like into the domain-driven design. I'm a big fan. Uh, but a domain model is a system of abstractions that describes selected aspects of a sphere of knowledge, influence, or activity. Very abstract. Uh, but every time that you are working in programming, and you go and you make your model classes for like user and then maybe transaction, um, you're, you're making a domain model. You're building objects that describe the problem domain that you're working in. Uh, and I'm working currently on a proposal with TC39 to get us a complete domain model for date and time at the language level. So uh, Temporal will be a new global, uh, like, like date or like math. It'll be a new global, and you'll chain off of that to create new objects. So we're introducing a whole bunch of new types because date is a huge domain. And I've got a lot of code on these slides, but I have to go quickly. I will post them online uh, because there's a lot of types to get through. So first of all, cancel date because it sucks. And separate the concept of absolute time. So assuming that we have a contiguous global timeline, that time always goes forward, it never goes backward, and it never has breaks, which is generally true, then we should be able to reference a point on that timeline and say, everyone in the world agrees that we were at that point. And that's actually what UTC is, right? Um, but in temporal, what we call this is absolute time. Conceptually, this is absolute time. Uh, and scenarios for absolute time are like log data. I want to know exactly when this event happened. Any kind of point in time events are absolute scenarios. And so in the new API, what you're going to do is when you have an absolute t scenario, point in time scenario, you're going to create a new absolute. Little thing I'll notice that we snuck in here, there's a big integer being passed to that, which makes our precision greater. Right now, date only supports milliseconds, but we're able to go out to nanosecond precision in the new proposal. Um, you can also parse an absolute from an ISO 8601 string, and it will parse the way the standard says and not any other way, um, which is great. Um, but besides point on the global timeline, we also have the concept of local date and time, like where we are now. And a lot of times when people talk about local date and time, um, it's just it's a perspective of time. And without any additional information, you don't actually know where it is on, on the global timeline, right? Maybe say it's 4 o'clock. you got to give me so much more information to know what that 4 o'clock really is. Uh, things to know about local time, it's actually non-contiguous. Because if DST transitions, you can have two instances of a local time. You know, when we do the fallback thing, you can also have gaps in that timeline where, uh, because we sprang forward, there's a series of times that don't exist. And we have to actually write specific code to make sure that when we try to convert to the global timeline, we handle those corner cases. So uh, local date time scenarios. You have a local date time object. Uh, biggest one is non-connected devices that later upload. So insulin pumps I brought up. Jana was teaching me all about this. It was amazing. Uh, but insulin pumps, uh, watches that later connect to the internet, things like Fitbits, anything that's connecting later, you're setting a local time on that. And then later on, you're uploading that local time and associating it with other data. Uh, so using date time, pretty simple. You come in and you say temporal.datetime, and you can parse it out of an ISO 8601 string. And this has no connection to the global timeline. It is simply a floating date and time. But obviously, we might want to connect these two things together. So the next thing that comes into play is temporal.timezone. 
And this is an object that describes that relationship between local time and that global absolute timeline. So you can actually represent three things that are not all exactly time zones in temporal time zone. One is you can make a time zone that is UTC, which is time zone of the global timeline. Another is you can make a fixed offset time zone. So that's like plus one. Be very careful. A fixed offset is not the same thing as a time zone. If you take a fixed offset date time, and then you say, I want to know what time it will be um, 72 hours from now. Because of DST changes, it may not be a straight 72-hour rotation. Um, the, the, the offset may have shifted. And then the final thing that we support is an IANA time zone. And that's um, the IANA time zone database, for those who aren't familiar, is like the master database of time and how it works everywhere. Uh, it includes um, not only information about when we do things like DST changes and what our offsets are all over the world, but it also includes historical information going back to basically the start of the railroads. Um, <laughs> so it gives us a lot of information over time of what we have chosen to have the offsets be in different places. Um, when combined with an absolute or a date time, a time zone gives you like a complete picture of everything that's happening here. It gives you the local time. It gives you the point on the global timeline. So uh, that lets us answer some really good questions, like at what point in time did the insulin pump run at? So uh, this is an important question to answer for your doctor, right? Like you have an offline insulin pump. It has a time. You upload those times to a computer. You were traveling. Your doctor wants to understand for your benefit when did your insulin pump go off. This seems like something that's really important to get right, doesn't it? <laughs> so you provide the time zone that you were in. Uh, you see providing the time zone that you're in, the local device, the string that came from the local device of the date time. You get a date time from the local device, the time zone, and then you say time zone dot get absolute for, so get me the point on the global timeline, and what you get back here is that point in global time. So I'm hoping you're starting to see that this API brings many different concepts together. These objects individually aren't that powerful, but when they're working together, they give us a very complete description of date and time. Uh, oh, I hit back. So. Uh, breaking apart local date and time, really common scenario is just a date. Um, so there's a date without a time, and it presents time assumption errors that cause unexpected behavior. So this is really common for dates of birth, like employment data hires, uh, holidays, report groupings where you want to say for the business day of. Anywhere where, like your birthday, like I was born in Minneapolis, but if I'm here in Paris on my birthday, I'm not going to like wait until Minneapolis clicks over to my birthday, I'm gonna be like, it's July 27th, it's my birthday, wherever I am. Uh, any other July 27th, like birthday paradox? I can't even see you, I'm sorry. If, if you share that birthday, I was a math major, I love the birthday paradox. Um, but so, this really cleans up Mr. Sulu's birthday. Uh, I can parse just a date, um, and then when I call it out to two string, I get just date information out. I can also, how many people are storing just date information in a database somewhere with a whole bunch of zeros appended because there was no good way to store just a date? Like someone's doing that, right? And then you get these funky bugs where you reparse it and it's a couple hours off because something shifted it to local time even though it wasn't supposed to be local time and actually didn't have any time at all. Um, <laughs> it would be better if you parse that into just a date and then what'll happen is your code will never shift uh, because nothing can have a weird side effect behavior. And if someone, say, tries to get your hours from just a date, they're going to get undefined. So they're not going to make a programming error of assuming later on that that time was actually a time. You're telling them very clearly, only dates here. So on that note, we also have scenarios where there's only a time, right? Uh, time without a date, again, it present, prevents date assumption errors. Probably somewhere you're storing like 1911, 1037 uh, for some purpose. Um, great for recurring meeting scheduling, data from non collected clock, uh, connected clocks. So, um, what we can see here is say you want to do a recurring meeting. Well, because of DST changes, you should never store recurring meetings in UTC because they'll shift around on you. You need to store them in local time. 
And here what we can see is I want to have a, a meeting twice in Paris, once on January 1st and once on April 1st. And we can see that I'm combining that 10 a.m. with the time zone and the date. And the first instance of my meeting comes out at 9 o'clock UTC, and the second comes out at 8 o'clock UTC. So it lets us cleanly express that that 10 a.m. in local time has two different um, actual UTC values. Uh, durations, I'll go really fast, used to express a length of time, uh, useful as a format in and of itself, uh, useful to add and subtract. Uh, so exactly how old is the is my dog, Mr. Sulu. I can come out here and I can have that returned as a duration. So you see down there a uh, period of five years, two months, three weeks, and four days. Very handy construct. Uh, other good stuff, so much content, so little time. This is a huge proposal. Uh, year, month, and month day. Year, month is good for things like historical time, like in December of 76, I was doing <laughs> Uh, historical time frames like that. Uh, month day is really good for holidays or birthdays. Mr. Schuler's birthday is September 12th. New Year's Day is January 1st. Alternate calendar systems. Uh, this is a huge aspect of this proposal. We're looking at getting in the Hebrew, Hijari, Japanese, the many other calendars supported directly in the language, which again, when we talk about inclusivity and JavaScript serves everybody, is, is really awesome. Uh, if you do regularly use an alternate calendar system, your feedback would actually be extremely helpful right now. If you could go to that GitHub issue and tell us how and in what ways, we would love it. Uh, so how do we get this done? Like, this is a lot of stuff. I hope it looks like, like hey, that would help me in my day-to-day -day job to program better. Uh, Temporal's currently at, ooh, stage two of that four-stage process we described. Um, we're working it towards stage three. The two to three jump is usually one of the longest jumps. It's actually been in stage two for over a year now, and I've been working on this for three years. Um, <laughs> Until stage three, the APIs are incredibly unstable, but we do have a polyfill out there in the repo that we'd love for you to try. Um, good news. Um, not everything like, is like this in TC39, but I would say that at a top level, everybody wants this proposal. There's nobody who's like, don't put better dates in this language. So that's good. Uh, that means we can probably move forward pretty well. Uh, this is a great space for community contributions and a space where are genuinely, like, especially if you have lived with different calendar systems in your day-to-day -day life, um, we could really use your feedback. So feel free to hop on that proposal, check out the polyfill, and come in and contribute. We're, we're not kidding, like, we, we, we need it. Like, we don't have the expertise. <laughs> um, I do wanna thank a few incredible people. Um, this proposal, as you can see, the API surface is huge. Like, I'm like talking really, really quickly, like it does this and this and this and this. It's not just like Maggie who does this. In fact, for the last year, it's been Philip Dunkel from Bloomberg who's done substantially more work than me. Uh, my husband, Matt, Dan Ehrenberg, Richard Gibson, Shane Carr, Brian Turleson, Ujwal Sharma, MS Tudor, who does not like his, he just uses GitHub handle, uh, all have invested like so much time in this. So thank you to all of those amazing people for helping to move this forward. Um, and again, I'm Maggie Johnson Pint. You can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, and uh, I hope you're feeling like confident that someday you're gonna have accurate date and time computations. Yeah. <laughs>